Now that the competitive part of the non-conference schedule is over, uh, apologies to Charleston Southern, it's time to take a look ahead to what awaits in ACC play. And let me tell you, this is no cakewalk. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Friday, December 22nd, 2023. It's almost Christmas. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank in particular you everydayers for joining us to get your Tar Heels content every day. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Hey, if you're new here, we want to welcome you in. So glad that you're here. If you'd like to be a bigger part of the Locked On Tar Heels community, come join the Locked On Tar Heels Discord where we're talking Carolina all day long. The link for that is in the show notes. Here's where we're going today, heading into Christmas weekend. Coming up on the show, we're going to have some stories from uh, folks a lot, in fact, from the Discord channel, some emails, stories about Eric Montross and encounters with him or experiences around him. And then at uh, our third segment today, we're going to be having our second ever moment with Maggie. If you missed the first one, this is my wife joining the show for some ridiculous hilarity uh, surrounding a North Carolina basketball game. So we're going to look back at her thoughts on the Oklahoma game from Wednesday night. But first, I want to take a look ahead at where things are going now as we move into ACC play. Carolina has 20 regular season games remaining. The uh, Charleston Southern game next Friday, a week from today, to wrap up the regular season. Um, On paper, that is the worst team Carolina will play all season. Uh, Again, apologies, Charleston Southern. It's just true. And then the 19 remaining ACC games. Remember, Carolina has already hosted Florida State. Great comeback victory in that game. So I want to look at where things stand in terms of net rankings currently what these games will be quad one through quad four, and then a couple uh, observations on this schedule of what we know now that we've seen how these teams are playing. So of the 19 ACC games left, obviously, since Carolina hosted that first one at home, there are now nine home games and 10 road games left. So a lot, uh, and obviously the Charleston Southern game is at home. So in totality, Carolina has 10 of each. Let me go through the order of these 20 games and tell you where they will fall in terms of quad rankings. Remember that it depends on where a team is ranked in the net and whether you're at home, uh, on the road, or a neutral site location. And these are flexible. It basically isn't set in stone until Selection Sunday. So these can always move as teams move up or down in the net rankings. But as of right now, as of this recording... Charleston Southern is a quad four game. And then Carolina starts ACC play with those three straight road games at Pitt, at Clemson, at NC State. All three of those are quad one opportunities right now. So Carolina should uh, be in great shape to get some quad one W's there if they do what they can do. After that, back-to-back home games, hosting Syracuse, that's a quad two, and then hosting Louisville, who, as you can imagine, is a quad four game, one of just uh, a few quad four games remaining on the schedule. Then back on the road to Boston College, that's a quad two, home to Wake Forest, quad three game right now, and then back-to-back road games at Florida State, at Georgia Tech. Both of those are quad three games. And that's dangerous territory because you're back to back on the road and both of them are quad threes. They don't do anything to help you. All those games can do is serve to hurt you if they lose them. So three straight quad three games hosting Wake Forest at Florida State at Georgia Tech. That is a tricky part of the schedule that Carolina cannot afford to drop a game in. So we'll kind of circle that one a little bit. After that, Um, back home for two games and then back on the road for two games. The reason I clump those together is after those three quad three games, four straight quad one opportunities, hosting Duke, hosting Clemson, then at Miami, then at Syracuse. That's a tough little stretch of the schedule, maybe a little bit overlooked, but make sure you don't miss it. I think a lot of that is because perhaps we thought, oh, Duke at home, that's a tough one. Eh, you host Clemson, that's not so bad. And then at Miami. And so you thought you had a breather of Clemson in between. But oh no, Clemson's right there. So that stretch is tough. Uh, 
Then you host Virginia Tech. That's a quad two game right there. Then you travel to Virginia. That's a quad one game, obviously, right now. Three straight home games after that, Miami, NC State, and Notre Dame. The Miami and NC State games are both quad two opportunities right now. And then, of course, the Notre Dame game, as you would imagine, they're actually worse than Louisville right now, if you can believe that. Notre Dame lost on Tuesday night by 20 to the Citadel at home. That's not a joke. That's a quad four game. And then, as you obviously know, wrapping up the regular season, going to Durham to face Duke, that is a quad one game. So let's add those all together. What are we looking at in these final 20 games? And again, this can and does change daily. But as of right now, as you look at these four quads and how Carolina's remaining 20 games fall into them, last year, there were so many ACC games that were not quad one or even quad two opportunities. But here's the good news. Of Carolina's remaining 20 games, 14 of them are either quad one or quad two, and nine of them, almost half of Carolina's remaining games, are quad ones. That is great news for Carolina's resume because you got, like the issue last year was that you just didn't have many opportunities to get high level victories. Carolina's got a ton of those this year. So four uh, of, of the 20 remaining games, excuse me, Three of them are quad four. That's the Charleston Southern game, the Louisville game, and the Notre Dame game. So that is what it is. Um, and then three of them are quad three games. That is that. And, it, and remember, they're all in a row right there. Versus Wake Forest at Florida State at Georgia Tech. And then you've got five quad twos and nine quad one games. Again, this is great for Carolina's resume. Even if you drop a couple of those quad ones, particularly on the road, that's okay. You just want to take advantage. Like, I mean, ideally you'd love to go nine and zero in those games. That's probably not realistic, but if Carolina in those quad one games could go six and three, seven and two, I'd feel great about that. Assuming they take care of business in the quad two, quad three and quad four games. Here's the kicker of those nine quad one games. Seven of them are on the road. And so that, that's something to keep in mind as well. So great opportunities in front of Carolina, but it is what it is. Now, also remember, there's a difference in resume and record. Resume is more important when we're thinking about Selection Sunday. You want to have good quality games. You want to win a bunch of them, but it's more important that you're playing big time games. And then in terms of the like quad three and quad fours, you just want to not lose them. They can't help you at all. They can only hurt you. So, so those quad one games are good resume opportunities. In terms of the, the lower ACC games, you like some of those in terms of record because it helps you have a better conference record, which goes towards potentially winning a regular season title. Unfortunately for Carolina, they don't play many games against like the lower part of the ACC, which is, again, Notre Dame is the worst, and then Louisville, and then Georgia Tech right above that. The problem for Carolina in a uh, non-balanced schedule, remember, we don't play home and home with every team. The issue is that Carolina only plays two total games against Louisville and Notre Dame, both at home. And Georgia Tech just wants two, <clears throat> although they're, they're not as bad as Louisville and Notre Dame. And so you compare that to the other top four teams in the ACC, which for me are, aside from Carolina, you've got Duke. Clemson, Miami, and Virginia. I see those five as the top five in the ACC. Well, Virginia and Duke have the advantage here because Duke plays um, Notre Dame and Georgia, excuse me, Notre Dame and Louisville four times. Virginia plays Notre Dame and Louisville four times as well. And both of those teams get Georgia Tech twice. So for Duke and Virginia, they've got this massive leg up because six of their 20 ACC games are against Louisville, Notre Dame, and Georgia Tech, the bottom feeders. So, so if we look up at the end of the regular season and Duke and Virginia are sitting above Carolina in terms of conference record, it won't be shocking. But their resume won't be as strong as Carolina because their strength of schedule comes down. Does that all make sense? If not, find me. I'll we can talk it through. Would love to would love to chat with you about it, maybe in Discord or, or whatever. I don't know. We could FaceTime or something. Um, but then along with North Carolina, who's only playing uh Louisville once, Notre Dame once, Georgia Tech once, Miami. They get um three games against Louisville and Notre Dame, 
Notre Dame home and home and then hosting Louisville. And then Clemson's in the same boat as Carolina, only playing Louisville and Notre Dame once each. So Clemson's kind of in that same boat as the Tar Heels. Kind of rough. Again, regular season conference title probabilities, advantage Duke and Virginia because of the schedule. Resume, advantage Carolina because they don't get they don't have to play those teams as much. Now, uh, let's move on from looking ahead to ACC play, and I want to move back to uh, spending some more time thinking about Eric Montross. Earlier in the week, obviously, we talked about his life and uh, just kind of memorialized that, and I had asked folks to share stories of encounters with Eric or thoughts about Eric, and lots of you did that, so I, I couldn't get them all into the show, but wanted to share some samples of that with you. So that's what we're going to do in just a second. Talk about stories from people who were impacted by Big Grits himself. And we'll get to those in just a second, right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by Game Time. Hey, we are three days away from Christmas and maybe you need a super last minute gift idea. Maybe tickets to the Charleston Southern game next week? Well, good news, you're in luck with Game Time, the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, the music, comedy, theater events near you. Killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time has exactly what you need. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to that big event, and thankfully, Game Time has you covered. They've got deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account, use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms apply. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, we're going to share some stories from Eric Montross's life. Thank you so much to all of you who have submitted stories. If you want to keep doing it, do it. Submit them on the Discord or email to LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com, and we can sprinkle them in throughout the Christmas season. This first one's a longer one from Emily Von Pocky, who we had uh, a story from, um, or a, a video question from on our mailbag the other week. And um, it, it's a great story from her, and I want to share it with you. She says, a chance meeting with my classmate and friend, Eric Montross. Goes like this Emily graduated from Carolina with Hubert Davis, two classes ahead of Eric at UNC. She had the honor and privilege of knowing both of them in school. Emily got to know Eric Hubert, Pete Chilcutt, Rick Fox, Matt Wenstrom, and a number of the players through her work with Carolina Fever as a student, and also had the honor of knowing Coach Smith through her work with the basketball office and was in classes with Matt Wenstrom as they were both majoring in poli sci. It was those circumstances that gave Emily the opportunity to interview both Coach Smith and Matt Winstrom in the spring of 1990. Not for the Daily Tar Heel, where she was a staff writer and editor, but for a journalism class assignment to go get an interview with a public figure. It'd be years later that Emily would have a chance meeting with Eric and have an opportunity to share those interviews with him that she did with his fellow 93 championship teammate and Coach Smith. And until now, those interviews have never been published. Years after graduation, Emily had the opportunity to see Eric at a Rams Club event, the Tar Heel Tour. Eric was greeting everyone, making everyone feel welcome, and catching up with old friends. Eric and Emily had a chance to talk about his work as the voice of the Tar Heels and took a photo to capture the moment. And Emily shared that with me and uh, uh, would love to share that with you. Maybe we'll drop it in the Discord so folks can see it there. Just a few months ago, Emily had yet another chance opportunity to see Eric at the ACC Men's Basketball Tournament in Greensboro. She had just started volunteering for the ACC as a way to reconnect with the conference and university that she's been a part of all these years. Emily was working the media credentials desk at the tournament. Just a couple days before that, her mom, who lives in Greensboro, had found those interviews that Emily did with Coach Smith and Matt Wenstrom all those years ago. Emily told Eric about the interviews, and he asked if he could have a copy to send to Matt, a rare chance encounter that gave two classmates an opportunity to share about the good old days and memories of their time at UNC. Even in that brief moment, Eric was not only thinking about his interest in having copies of the interviews, but as always, Eric was also thinking of his teammate, a moment that is so reflective of who Eric was, selfless, kind, and including others in anything that he could share or give. Emily no longer had the original article because it had been turned in as homework to her journalism professor. So she had promised Eric that she would complete a new write-up 
type up the transcript of the interviews from old 1990s computer printout and include a forward with some photos from those years with Coach Smith. Having seen Eric's video at the Carolina Basketball Live event, uh, that gave everyone hope and encouragement that he was getting better. Emily decided that it would be the right time to get that article to Eric, so she had hesitated to follow up back with Eric earlier in March because it was just a week after she saw him at the tournament that we all learned the devastating news of his cancer diagnosis. Just a little over a week ago, like in real time, Emily took color copies of the interview to the basketball office with a forward and photos included. She then emailed Eric, letting him know that the basketball office would get his copy to him and would take care of getting a copy to Matt and Coach Davis as well, his fellow teammates that he loved so much. On a final note, it was in that interview in the spring of 1990 that Emily had asked Coach Smith uh, about a very special win that season over a number one ranked team. That team was Oklahoma, who Carolina played on Wednesday. The Tar Heels defeated Oklahoma in the NCAA tournament. Uh, on March 17th, 1990, 79 to 77. When asked what that win meant to him, Coach Smith replied, the win over OU meant a great deal to me because of our seniors. Beating the number one team in the nation is always nice, but for me personally, the win gave our seniors some recognition and sense of accomplishment. How fitting that in the week of Eric's passing, the Tar Heels will again have taken on the Sooners. And this time, win or lose, they will all be coaching and playing with their hearts for the name and memory of their beloved Carolina teammate, Eric Montross, UNC class of 1994. For Emily, as she remembers the life of her classmate and friend, Eric will forever be in all our hearts as number double zero Tar Heel Center, who led the 1993 team to get Coach Smith his second national title. Eric's heart was even bigger than his presence on the court, and he will forever be missed in the lives of the Carolina family. Very well done, Emily. Thank you so much for sharing that. And how wild that you had had uh, that opportunity to take those um, transcripts and interviews and pictures just a week before um, Eric's passing. And so what a neat moment that was. Emily, thank you so much for sharing. The rest of these are a, a few shorter memories and just want to share them with you as well. This one is an email from T2UNC21, who's always active. Thanks so much for sending this in. Says this, I was back in Chapel Hill for the 93 Final Four and watched the championship game from the old Spankies on the corner of Franklin Street in Columbia across from top of the hill, and it was an awesome event. I remember walking around campus the following week and running into Eric Montross. I didn't want to bother him. Just amazing how tall and nice the guy was to people that came up and wanted to talk to him. Ah, that's great. Such a simple remembrance, but a great one of Eric as well, bumping into him. This next one comes from Nintendnerd on the Discord. Thanks, as always, for sending this love, uh, interacting with Nintendnerd. says this, I'm too young to have seen Eric Montross play in person, although I do understand the amazing player and person he was. However, my dad has a personal connection to Montross, as he is the reason that my dad got to see his first Carolina game in person. This is super cool. Dean Smith always promised his four-year commits that they'd play a game close to home, and Eric Montross played at Lawrence North uh, High School there in the Indianapolis area. My dad is an Indiana native, which is where Lawrence North is, and that year Carolina would play at Butler as Eric Montross's homecoming game. My dad used that chance to go to his first ever UNC game. As a matter of fact, that same year, Carolina would go on to win the national championship. While this event is not the reason my dad is a Tar Heel, it most certainly enhanced his fandom and in part played a role in my dad passing his Tar Heel blue blood on to me. I found out this story the day of Eric's passing and I will never forget it. The fact that Eric Montross, a player I never knew, I never grew up watching, played at least a small role in why I am a Tar Heel today. R.I.P. Big Grits. Whoo, man, that's got me in my feels on that one. Thank you, Nintendo Nerd, for sharing that. Uh, another one from the Discord from our guy Will828, who's always active as well. He says this, I am old enough to have watched Eric play and remember watching his iconic game where he got the gash under his eye. I watched that game with my pops and remember very well how mad he got after the elbow. That is hilarious. I was nine or 10 years old and thought he was mad at me at first and then thought he was crazy for yelling at the TV. But it wasn't long after that we both were yelling and I completely understood. Eric was the first seven footer I ever stood next to in my life. I was young, but remember thinking he was a true giant and he was indeed. RIP Big Grits, I'm praying for his family. Thanks for sharing that one. 
Two more. This one comes from UNC Minded on Discord. I used to live in Chapel Hill, and I'm guessing I must not have lived too far from Eric Montross. I would regularly see him at the gas station and at Walmart. My kids, who were six and three at the time, loved it. And seeing someone that tall always made their day. And he was always happy to shake a hand and say hello. He will be missed deeply by the Carolina family and maybe even more by the community in general. He was always such a kind and giving man. Ah, that's just such a great, I mean, just even hanging out at the gas station or Walmart, Eric Montross was the person that you know. This is not just when the lights are on, this is Eric Montross. Our last one, this comes from Travis K on the Discord. Travis says, I just started doing the father-son Eric Montross Father's Day basketball camp last summer. Eric obviously wasn't able to be there because of his health, but it was so much fun hearing the stories from previous campers about how awesome he was and watching a video that he put together. I wish I could have met him. Rest in peace, Big E. Man, thank you, Travis. And, and so true um, of, of what an impact he had, even when his presence wasn't physically there. So I want to thank everyone again for sending in these stories. So many great um, memories, whether actual encounters with Eric or just seeing him from afar. That's the kind of man he was that he was able to still have that level of impact. Well, you saw the OU game on Wednesday night and so did my wife, Maggie, who is a proud Texan and therefore has no love for the Sooners. She's got thoughts. It's time for our second ever moment with Maggie and that'll be coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders. They've even got regular season odds for all the conference uh, major conferences, including the ACC. Right now, it's Duke plus 280, Carolina plus 300, Clemson at 470, Virginia plus 550, and Miami at plus 600. See, told you those are the top five teams. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked in to get in on that action or NFL action this season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, it's time for our second ever moment with Maggie. We are actually coming to you today, my wife Maggie and I, from Branson, Missouri, as they say down here in Missouri. Um, right, actually, right after Carolina knocks off Oklahoma, eighty-one to sixty-nine. If you missed our first moment with Maggie, this is where we invite my wife in to um, give us her very educational, very informed basketball thoughts on how this game went. So Maggie, I'm just going to start by giving you the floor yeah. and let's kind of hear some of your thoughts. By the way, I should mention, and I apologize for not, Maggie what? is a proud Texan. I am. It's true. Hook them. And so like down with Boomer sooner. And so like, that's a big part of this conversation. Yeah. So I, let me just start by saying tonight was a really magical night for our family. And I will say this, Tonight, we took our children to the Polar Express. I'm not talking about we talk, We took our children to watch the movie, The Polar Express. We took our children to ride on a train where they got a cookie. We all got a cookie. A cookie. We got hot chocolate. Um, the, the conductor punched our, our gold ticket. Santa himself came along, gave us all a bell, and that was not the most magical part of my night. <laughs> the most magical part of my night was watching OU lose. <laughs> I love when OU loses. I don't care if they lose in football or basketball or soccer or basket weaving or whatever other kinds of things that you can lose in. I love watching OU lose. So I had a magical night, and honestly, it wasn't even because of the Polar Express. Uh, the, and the Polar Express is magical. It was I mean, magical, this is, but this, this is just mm, chef's kiss. Uh, so that's great. Down with OU, especially after, you know, 
I apologize for mentioning this after what happened it. on the Don't talk about okay. it. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. I apologize for that. Texas lost to Oklahoma in football. But it was um, bad. Maggie, this obviously was a critical game for North Carolina to finish off the main chunk of the non-conference yeah. part of the schedule. What else did you think about this game? Anything from the game itself or from Oklahoma's players or Porter Moser? They're a very interesting coach. Uh, not a lot from the game itself, I'll be honest. Um, I do have this one thought. That was a late game. That game started at 8 o'clock p.m. Central time. We're in central time. Central time. I don't like to start anything after 8 o'clock p.m. I don't like to start a movie. I don't like to start a meal. I don't even like to start my bedtime routine after 8 p.m. I like to have, by 8 p.m., I want to have my face washed. I want to have my teeth brushed. I want to have my contacts out and my retainers in by 8 p.m. That's what I like. I don't like to start anything after 8 p.m. So the fact that this game started after 8 p.m., that was a little tough for me. <laughs> I feel like most people will not feel this way, but I would like to um, – maybe visit the opportunity of like a 6 a.m. game. A.m.? Yeah, like that feels better to me <laughs> than like the night games because I don't like I don't like late night things. Like there's there's a game on right now and it is late at night. And if I were an Alabama fan, which is a bad example because I would never be an Alabama fan. <laughs> Why? Why would I do that? Yeah. But if I were a fan of a game that started at like 10 p.m., I would, it would, that no. would be done. And, and this thing's 11 this Eastern is, that's crazy. Arizona. That's absolutely Alabama. crazy. Absolutely that's crazy. Bonkers. I would like to maybe talk about early morning games. You know, Caleb Love's playing in this that. game. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. He used to be a Tar Heel. He did. Now he he's a, a uh, now he's not. Arizona. So um, Maggie, other thoughts on Oklahoma. Other thoughts. Oh, uh, OU's coach. I feel like I, I have a lot of thoughts on what, what I think coaches should be doing instead of. Uh, yes. Coaching basketball yes. simply based on their appearance. And this one, I, I'm not going to lie. Legitimately, I'm not going to lie. I asked you if that was his their coach because when I saw him, I thought there's a poor boy on this team whose dad they let on the sidelines <laughs> who is living vicariously through his 19-year-old son because that is what – he kind of looks like the dad from One Tree Hill. That's a little Never bit – I mean, not like looks like him, but like looks like the intensity of like – your team lost in the state championship of 1987, and now you got to live it out through your kid. That's a little bit what it felt like. Mm. So we've kind of looked at the Oklahoma side of things yeah. a lot. Any thoughts on the on the Tar Heels side of things? Because we want to obviously celebrate and lift up <laughs> this team. Listen, I learned something new tonight. <laughs> Legitimately, I learned something new tonight. His name, that boy's name is Cormac Ryan. It's not Ryan Cormac. <laughs> that is true. Uh I thought this whole season his name was Ryan Cormack. I just never thought about the fact that it was like flipped. And that shook me a little bit because in my head he was Ryan Cormack this whole season. And I Googled him during the game just yeah. to make sure I was reading that correctly. <laughs> and the pictures that came up, he was wearing a different jersey in every picture that That's came right. up. He has played at a lot of different schools. He has. Do you know who they are? Uh Notre Dame. Yep, that's where I he saw came from Notre Dame. I saw maybe a Stanford. Yep, he started at Stanford, went okay. to Notre Dame. Now okay. he's at Tar Heel, and, and he's like eighty-seven years he's old. He's very old. 25. So I feel like maybe they should call him like Papa Cormac, Papa <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> Papa Ryan Cormac, Ryan, <laughs> Ryan Cormac, Ryan, Ryan Cormac, Ryan. Make maybe his parents were like, listen, he's got a first name for a last name, so we're not going to give him two first names, so we're going to give him a last name for a first name. Uh, that's legit. Did. Also, I looked up his high school. Or, I mean, I was, like, looking him up, and I saw that he went to high school somewhere, which I feel like. He went to high school somewhere. <laughs> this is breaking news. Cormac Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Cormac, Cormac went, went to, to high, high school. school. Great news. He went to a school that I'm I'm pretty sure, just by, like, the name of it, it belongs in Gilmore Girls, which I have a <laughs> feeling that most of your listeners don't know much about Gilmore Girls. But if there is some crossover, if there are Locked on Tar Heels uh, listeners that also watch – Gilmore Girls, I feel like you're my people. You're people. Uh, that's great. Any other final thoughts on this game or, or how the Tar Heels have been looking ahead of the Christmas day? You know what? Tar Heels looked good. They looked great. Ryan Cormack looked good. Um, OU did not look good, and that was great, and I don't think they should have been ranked that high. I think that they – obviously, we talked about this the other day. I was like, what's up with their strength of schedule? Not great. I'm pretty sure that they – played our second grade son's basketball team and beat them, <laughs> which like valiant effort by 
our second graders, but you know, they were playing college kids. So it, good job. It's OU. true. Yes. OU has now fallen out of the ranks of the undefeateds. There are only three left at the time of this recording. Who's that? The other three. Yeah. It is Houston. Okay. Texas. James, James Madison. Okay. And Ole Miss. Okay. That's good for the them. Three. Way to go. Those guys. Yeah. Did they play our second grade team or have they played actual uh, You know, teams? Um, a little bit of both. Okay. James Madison beat Michigan State. Okay, that's good. So there you you go. know what? Uh, the Tar Heels beat Michigan State in a national championship one time. Do you remember which one? Oh, nine. That's right. Ah! Check her out. That's baller status. Marry me. Yes. Marry me. Well, you remember because that was the year we got married. It was. Yes. Love that. All right, folks. This has been a moment with Maggie. Thank you so much for tuning in. I think we'll have to have you back again sometime at a later know. date. Maybe after the next game against Charleston Southern. Is that a real team? Charleston Southern? <laughs> Never heard of them. That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend leading up to Christmas. And uh, we will talk to you again. Still going to have five shows next week, even in Christmas week. We'll obviously get ready for the bowl game. We'll get ready for the Charleston Southern game on Friday. Thursday show recapping the bowl game is going to be delayed because my wife is taking me on some kind of surprise trip that I don't even know about yet. And so that'll be coming at you. But Monday and Tuesday are going to be some fun kind of Christmas themed shows. So I'm looking forward to that. Come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord where we're having great Carolina conversation all the time. The link to that is in the show notes. If you've got something else you want to talk about, maybe more in depth, email the show LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on video and audio. Rate and review. Those ratings really help and really matter. Five stars. Talk about why you love it. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button so we know you're here and would love to hear your comments on today's show. We'll talk again on Monday on Christmas Day. Maybe you need to escape from your family. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, but until then, peace. Peace.